Last year, I received two major invitations. The first was to one of my best friends from high school's bachelor party in the poutine capital of the world, Montreal. My friends from high school live 2,767 miles away from me, approximately. So you can imagine that I rarely get to see them. And when I do, I really cherish those moments. The second invitation was to report to the Hall of Justice for jury duty. And when I got there, I was one of about 100 people to show up, so I figured I had about a 12% chance of getting selected. I wasn't too worried. Well, you can imagine my surprise the next day when I found my right arm up being sworn in as juror number four. I told the clerk that I had a trip coming up. I was going to Montreal in four weeks. Would that be a problem? And the clerk said, don't worry about it. The judge thinks that this case will take 10, 12 days tops. You'll be in and out before you know it. And I said, OK. The, the case was to determine if a man had committed felony domestic assault against his girlfriend over the course of two years. Not exactly lightweight material. And before the case began, the judge gave us this big booming speech about how important it was that we participate in a jury trial and how the founding fathers themselves had literally laid this out in the Constitution. And he told us that it was of the utmost importance that we not discuss the details of this trial with our friends, family, or members of our clergy. <laughs> so the trial begins, and the days take on this particular cycle. Every day we would go in and listen to heartbreaking testimony from this woman. She would talk about being struck or thrown or strangled or intimidated, sometimes in front of her own infant daughter. And at the end of the day, the judge would say, please abide by my previous admonition. Do not discuss the details of this trial with your friends, family, or members of your clergy. So I would repress those emotions and go home and do my day job at night, because as it turns out, that was the only way I could still collect a paycheck. So the next day we would come in and we would watch body camera footage in their entirety from the cops, it, just hours and hours of body camera footage. And at the end of the day, the judge would say, please abide by my previous admonition. Do not discuss the details of this trial with your friends, family, or members of your clergy. So I would repress those emotions and go home and do my day job at night. After two weeks, I said to the clerk, hey, listen, I have that trip coming up in two more weeks. Is that going to be a problem? And he said, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. I said, OK. The next week rolls around, and there's an ER doctor who is on staff. And he's describing in visceral detail how she had been hit so hard that her chest was filling up with this fluid that, if left unchecked, could strangle her heart and cause cardiac arrest. And he had this x-ray, and he was showing exactly where he had to separate two ribs in order to put this tube in to relieve the pressure. And at the end of the day, the judge says, please abide by my previous admonition. Do not discuss the details of this trial with your friends, family, or members of your clergy. So I repressed those emotions, and I went home and did my day job at night. And at the end of the week, I said to the clerk, you know, is this really going to wrap up in the next five to six business days? I have a trip coming up. Uh, I just want to make sure it's fine. He said, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. So the next week, there's this ever-present emotional death grip on my throat. And every day I go in there, it's getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And we're listening to testimony from people that live in the apartment building. And they're describing, in their own words, why they called 911. They're talking about why they heard this big commotion and then a blood-curdling scream followed by the sound of a body hit the floor, and then the far more concerning sound of silence. And at the end of the day, the judge says, please abide by my previous admonition. Do not discuss the details of this trial with your friends, family, and members of your clergy. So I repressed those emotions, and I would go home and do my day job at night. And I said to the clerk, listen, I have a trip to Montreal on Tuesday. I'm going to see friends I never get to see, and it means the world to me. Please tell me I can still go. And the clerk says, we can't discuss hardships until the day before your trip. But if you're lucky, the judge will put one of the alternates in, and you'll be excused. So Monday rolls around, and I'm done. I don't quit things, but I couldn't pretend that listening to this day in and day out and not being able to talk to anybody about it, not even non-existent members of my clergy, wasn't having <laughs> a profound effect on me. And at the end of the day, the judge says, now, I'm to understand a member of this jury has a trip to take. And I said, yes, Your Honor. I'm going to Montreal. I leave tomorrow morning at 8 AM. I'll be gone for two weeks. I don't return until the 27th. And the judge says, now, if I were to not permit you to go on this trip, would this color your judgment and render you no longer an impartial juror on this trial? And I knew that this was my opportunity to be honest and frankly selfish. 
And I thought about it one last time, and I said, yes, Your Honor, I believe that to be the case. <laughs> and he thought about that for a moment, and he furrowed his brow. And then he leaned forward and said, then it's settled. We'll take a two-week hiatus. We'll reconvene on the 28th. Please abide by my previous admonition. Do not discuss the details of this trial with your friends, family. And I could feel the color draining from my face. And I look at my fellow jury members, and I can see the color draining from their faces. And I look at the defendant, the defense counsel, and the district attorney, and I can see the color draining from their faces. And then in unison, slowly turning to look at me. I spent two wonderful weeks in Montreal. <laughs> and I would love to tell you more about it, but the groom asked us not to discuss the details of the bachelor party with our friends, family, and say it with me, members of our clergy. But what I can tell you is that every day I thought about that trial. I thought about that woman, I thought about that man, I thought about the attorneys, all of whom had entrusted in me to deliver one one-dozenth of a verdict. And here I was, 4,211 kilometers approximately away, literally fleeing my responsibilities. And I started to feel equal parts embarrassment and equal parts pride in what my role as a juror was. And suddenly I couldn't wait to get back to San Francisco. And when I got back to SF and I went back to the Hall of Justice, I absorbed a number of sideways glances, but I didn't care. I was ecstatic that I had been given a second chance to see this case through to its completion. And after two more weeks of the trial and four days of intense jury deliberation, we delivered our verdict. And on the final day, the judge thanked us again for our service and said that he reminded us how important it was what we had just done. And as his final word to us said that we were now free to discuss the details of this trial with our friends, family, and members of our clergy. Thank you. Keep it going for Charles, Charles Scheinblum.